Uh, my name is Jan Hladký and this webinar is organized together with, with Jan Volec, Liana Jepremian and Diana Pige. Before we, before we start with the talk itself, let me go through some specifics of this uh, online format. So A, we apologize for, if you, if you noticed, we changed the link to this webinar recently. So, so the original session was under a different link, uh, but now this is a different Zoom mode, which we hope will work better. So it's more interactive. This time you can uh, see other people's faces. So it's almost like we were not all stuck at home. Uh, so let's see, and perhaps we will keep this setting for, for future uh, seminars as well. We will keep the same password. So the password you use this time, if things work and we are not uh, Zoom bombed in the future, we will keep the same password. Uh, I think I muted all of you, all the participants initially. If you have questions during the talk, then please either use chat and then maybe some other participants can answer to, uh, uh, help you uh, and answer your questions. So this has worked fairly well uh, previously. And another option is that you raise your hand. So in the list, in one of the windows, which is uh, the list of participants, at the bottom, uh, there is an option to raise. There is a, a little icon of a, of a hand and you can raise your hand there. So this seminar is being recorded and uh, will be uh, in a day or two will be posted on YouTube. So you, uh, you agree to being recorded if, which will only happen if you are asking questions. At the end of this seminar, we will have uh, questions and answers and then there will be questions and answers without being recorded in, in case everyone, anyone doesn't uh, wish to be recorded. Okay, so I think that's uh, that's all for the, the, the practical uh, matters. And now I'm happy uh, to introduce our today's speaker, Ehud Friedgut from the Weizmann Institute in Israel. And Ehud will talk about the Edesh Corrado uh, theorem. So Ehud, please. Okay, hi, thank you. And thank all of you for joining us here. Um, Okay, so uh, I'm the top uh, page of my presentation uh, states the Erdős Corrado theorem, um, but I'm not going to be talking about the Erdős Corrado theorem, but rather a variant of it. And I'm going to present five and a half different proofs of it, and you can ask yourself why would we want to see different proofs of same theorem. And I think the answer is that uh, different proofs give you different perspectives. And um, there are many different generalizations of Erdős Corrado that you might want to prove. And each one of these proofs might be useful uh, for developing a different direction of uh, research. OK, so let's start with the basic theorem. Um, yeah, so uh, the Erdős Corrado theorem. We have two integers, r and n, and r is less than half of n. And we have a family of sets, curly A. They're all sets of size r, subsets of n. And it's an intersecting family, meaning that any two members in the family have non-empty intersection. And what the Erdős-Corrado theorem says, or the very basic uh, case of the Erdős-Corrado theorem says that in this case, uh, the largest such intersecting family as size n minus 1 choose r minus 1. And that's precisely what you get if you take a family which fix some element between 1 and n, take all sets that contain it, that has size n minus 1 choose r minus 1. And um, if r is, well, of course, if r, the reason r is less or equal to n over 2 is if it's greater than n over 2, all r sets intersect. But if r is strictly less than n over 2, then we have uh, uh, equality can be um, uh, characterized. You have equality if and only if A is what's called a star, which I just defined. It's, there is some element I such that A is just all sets containing I. And note that uh, um, 
the size of the maximal family divided by the size of the universe is R over N. And it makes, well, it makes sense that if you fix a point, you take an R set, the probability of it uh, containing a given element is R over N. And th this, uh, this parameter R over N will, uh, will appear later. So these yellow blobs uh, remind me that I might want to uh, cut this line and paste it later on. And of course, there are many, many generalizations of the erdos corrado theorem. There are uh, vector spaces and, and groups, and, and you can ask what happens if the intersection of every two families has two, uh, of two sets in the family has at least two elements in common or three elements in common, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And today I want to uh, focus on a um, specific uh, uh, generalization. So now uh, I don't restrict the size of the sets anymore. My family sits inside 0, 1 to the n, and I'll keep this dual uh, uh, way of looking at 0, 1 to the n in, in our mind, that on one hand it's binary vectors, on the other hand I'll just think of it as sets. So a vector is the indicator of a certain set. So I still think of A, even though it sits inside 0, 1 to the n, as a family of sets. Um, and, uh, and now, once again, the premise is that the uh, family is an intersecting family. Well, if it's intersecting, clearly uh, the size of the set is at most uh, the size of the family is at most 2 to the n minus 1 because you can never have a set and its complement in the family simultaneously. So you can have at most half of the sets. So that, that's not very interesting. But, uh, but if instead of um, counting sets, we look at a different product measure on the cube, things become a bit more interesting. So now we define a probability measure on the cube uh, for a fixed set in the cube. Uh, the probability of that set or the measure of that set, I just think that I flip n coins which show heads with probability p and uh, tails with probability 1 minus p. And um, this is the probability of seeing the set a, p to the size of a, 1 minus p to the power n minus a. And the measure of my family is just the sum of the measures in, in the set. So this is a product measure, a probability measure on the cube. Um, and here I wrote it in vector notation, but it's the same thing. The measure of the vector x is p to the number of ones in x times one minus p to the number of zeros in x. And now here's the theorem which, whose proofs we're going to study today. Let p be less or equal to one half, which is um, the analogy of uh, r being less or equal to half of n. And we have an intersecting family, then, the measure of the family is at most p. And as before, if p is strictly less than one half, then equality can be characterized. You have equality if and only if a is precisely the family of all sets containing a given element. So a is a star. So that's the theorem. And now let's start looking at some of the proofs. OK, so here is proof number one. Um, proof number one, uh, going to Asymptopia and back. Asymptopia is this utopic place, a place of utopia where all the asymptotics work. So um, first of all, notice that since uh, if I take A and I add to every set in A all its supersets, then I preserve the property that the family is intersecting. So, and since we're trying to give an upper bound on the size of the family, we can assume without loss of generality that our family is upper closed. And now, um, just to make the proof more concrete, um, think, let's say, for example, P is one third, and assume by way of contradiction that the measure of my family is greater than one third, it's 0 0.4. So now I'm going to do something very strange. You see, A is a subset of 0, 1 to the n, I'm going to embed it in a larger space. So uh, I'm just going to uh, tack on to the end of each uh, vector in um, A, uh, two to the n minus, two to the capital N minus small n different uh, uh, suffixes. So I just embedded my family in a larger space. 
And this, this looks really strange because I haven't changed anything. How can this help me study the family? Well, it turns out it can. So uh, this picture here is supposed to be uh, zero one. This, this is supposed to be uh, zero one to the capital N. And um, now the reason I'm looking at very large N is uh, uh, when we take very large N, the measure, the, the, the product measure is very tightly concentrated uh, on um, a P times N. So P is one third. Uh, yeah, this should be here one third. So if we look at one third N uh, plus minus square root N log N, this part of the cube carries all the measure of the cube, almost all the measure of the cube. So if our family has measure 0 0.4, I have to push all the 0 0.4, except for epsilon maybe, into these layers of the, the cube, because that's where the whole probability measure of the cube sits. Now, an easy fact is that if I have an upward closed family, then it, its density is monotone. If you go from a layer to the layer containing it, as you go up in the cube, the, the density goes up and up and up. So if the weight here is 0 0.4 minus epsilon, means that if we go to the very top of the uh, layer in this, in this slice, the, the density is already quite close to 0 0.4. So for example, if we go even further up to uh, level 0 0.35 times n, which is outside of the slice, there the density has to be so close to 0 0.4 and it has to be at least 0 0.36 n. But then this is a contradiction to the discrete erdos corrado theorem because now I just set uh, r equals uh, 0 0.35 times n and uh, I've just found an, uh, an intersecting family in this level which, is, uh, which has measure greater than r over n. So that, that would contradict the discrete erdos corrado theorem. So that shows that uh, we found a contradiction. Okay, so that, that's proof number one. And this proof shows us that you can go from the discrete case to the continuous case. And um, it's rather surprising that this arbitrary embedding, which, which really doesn't add any extra information, enables us to use the fact that the, the measure becomes more focused and to go from the continuous to the discrete. Okay, proof number two. Proof number two is due to uh, Yuval Filmus, and it's uh, Filmus's adaptation of Katona's proof of Erdős Corrado. So, uh, Katona has a famous proof of the Erdős Corrado theorem. It's really a book proof, and I once wrote a paper where I tried to um, adapt it to the continuous setting. And Yuval was taking a course with me at the time, and he came across the paper, and he came and told me that the proof I have in the paper is the wrong proof, the wrong adaptation of Katona's proof. And he showed me the correct one. And that's what I'm going to show you now. And this is, this is the book proof. This is the book version of Katona's proof. So here's what we do. We um, take, this is a circle. What you see here uh, is a circle which has circumference, circumference one. And uh, I fix an interval of length P on the circle. And now I choose the points 1 up to n uniformly at random on the circle. So 1 falls here, and 2 falls here, and 3 falls here, and n falls here. And uh, the probability, and for each point I do it independently, so the probability of falling inside the interval is, of course, p. So the measure of a, a, a set A is, pr is precisely the probability that the content of the interval i is equal to the set A. So, uh, and of course, so the, the measure of our uh, family is the probability that uh, um, the content of the interval belongs to the family. So this is a way of, of measuring the measure of the family. But now we reverse the order in which we do the things. First, fix the points. And I don't care if you fix them at random, because what I'm going to tell you, or arbitrarily, this is going to work for any choice of points. I, I choose the points, 
And now I choose the interval at random. So I'm choosing at random an interval of length p. And um, let's say, uh, just for the sake of calculation, uh, for a mon moment that here's this interval that goes from x to x plus p. And let's say it belongs to my family, uh, that the content of this interval belongs to my family. The, the, oh, sorry, I don't want to do that. That the, oh, I'm on eraser mode. That the points that fall in this side, this interval belong to my family. Then if I have a different interval, an interval J whose content also belongs to my family, then I know that J, J has to intersect with the I. Because uh, if J and I don't intersect, their, their content is also disjoint. So, uh, any, any other interval whose content belongs to the family has to intersect i. So if j goes from y to y plus p, then y has to be close enough to x. So y has to be somewhere between x minus p and x plus p. So that gives us a bound that if I choose j at random and ask what's the probability that the content of j belongs to my family, it gives me a bound of 2p. But I wanted a bound of 1p. So where does the how do I get from 2p to 1p? Well, the answer is that if we look at, uh, at these two intervals, y to y plus p and y plus p to y plus 2p, only one of these intervals belongs to our family because they're disjoint. So it, it looks at first that I have the measure of y's which can work is 2p, but then I can put them in pairs and only one element from each pair can belong to my family. So the, the measure of y's which work is at most p, therefore the probability of this event, the content of the uh, interval belonging to my family is at most p. And as we said above, the, the measure of my family, the measure of my family is precisely the probability that um, the content of the interval belongs to my family. So if this holds for every, arbitrary fixed set of, of points, then it has to hold, this bound holds on average. So if you choose the points and then choose the interval, probability of the content of the interval belonging to the family is at most p. So this gives you a second proof of the, of the theorem. Okay, uh, let's see, what's going on in the chat? No chats, good. So, um, proof number three. Proof number three is a uh, Fourier proof, but you see I, I put the Fourier in double quotes because it's, it's not exactly Fourier. I'll explain why it's not exactly. So um, we're dealing with a probability space, a measure space, so it is a natural way to define an inner product between functions. The inner product between f and g, everything here, real functions, it's just the expectation of f times g, so the integral of f times g. And now um, we have an inner product. I want to define an orthonormal basis for the space of functions on this space. So let's start with a two-point space. So from now on, um, Q is one minus P. Okay, so Q is one minus P. And let's say uh, I, I, N is one, I have only uh, two points. So the measure of zero is Q and the measure of one is P. These are the points is zero and one. And first of all, I can define the constant function, which is constant one. It's one here and it's one here. And then I want to find a function which is uh, orthogonal to that function and which has norm one. Well, up to the sign, there's only one, uh, up to multiplying it by minus one, there's only one way to do that. And turns out this is the function. It has uh, the value square root of p over q at zero and minus square root of q over p at one. So th this gives you two functions. They're an orthonormal basis for the space of functions on the two-point space. And now if I take the endpoint space, I just have to tensor this, um, these functions with themselves. So for every, uh, for every i, which is a subset of one up to n, I can define this uh, function psi i, which is the product of uh, psi little i for all 
elements I and big I. So psi I, here uh, I wrote psi I, meaning that I was thinking of the ith coordinate. So uh, this function only depends on the coordinates in I. And if you take all possible such functions, there are two to the n of them. This gives you an orthonormal basis to our space. And now if I have any function on the space, a real function, I can expand it in terms of these, uh, uh, in terms of this orthonormal basis. So I have a function f, f of x is sum of some coefficients times these functions. And these coefficients, I'm using the Fourier notation, uh, but if you want to know what the, the coefficient of a certain func uh, one of these functions is, then just take the inner product of both sides with psi i, and everything will cancel out because they're orthonormal and you'll get the, the coefficient of, of uh, psi capital I. So this is, you can take this as the definition or the way to calculate this coefficient. And um, so here are some uh, uh, properties of this expansion. So first of all, if you want, if you look at the coefficient of uh, the function, which is uh, indicated by the empty set, sorry, um, so psi empty set is just the function which is identically one. Um, so if I take the inner product with one, I just, just, I just get the expected value of f. And if I want the expected value of f squared, then I take the inner product of f with itself. All the cross terms cancel out and I get the sum of the squares of the coefficients. This is just Parseval. Um, by the way, th the reason I said this is only pseudo Fourier, it's not really Fourier, is that the set of these functions aren't a group. Uh, when p is equal to one half, and I multiply two of these functions, I get a, uh, another function which belongs to this uh, set, which turns the set into a group. Here, the product of the two of these functions isn't necessarily one of these functions. So it's not really a group. It's not really uh, a Fourier transform. It's but it's reminiscent of a Fourier transform. Okay, so all of this is, how can this be used to analyze our intersecting family? So we have this intersecting family A, and we look at its characteristic function. So it's a function which is equal to one on elements in A, and zero outside of A. So uh, let me write that, uh, f of A equals, zero if A doesn't belong to my family, and one if A belongs to my family. And then the expectation of F is just the measure of, of my family. And let's denote that measure by a mu. And also, this is also the expectation of F squared because F is a zero, one function. So the expectation of F is the same as the expectation of F squared. So this is mu, and recall mu is also, it's, it's, first of all, because it's the expectation, it's the Fourier coefficient of the empty set, and it's also the sum of the squares of the coefficients. Okay, now I'm going to choose two random vectors, x and y, but they're not independent. I want, if you just look at x or just look at y, I want it to look like a random vector chosen according to the product probability measure. So the marginals of x and the marginals of y are supposed to have the distribution mu p. However, I want a, a x and y to have disjoint support. So if there's a certain coordinate of x, which is one, y has to be zero on that coordinate. Um, so a way of saying that is, uh, let's look at, fix some i between one and n, and let's look at the pair x i, y i. So, it can't be one, one, because X and Y have to be, have this joint support. It has, so the probability of that is zero. Since I want the marginal of X to be mu P, then the probability that X I is one has to be P, but then Y I has to be zero. And similarly, the probability of zero, one has to be P. And then the probability of zero, zero has to be one minus two P. So, and here we see that P has to be less than one half. Uh, which reminds me that I didn't say in the previous theorem, where did I use the fact that P was less than one half here? Because if it was more than one half, these intervals could wrap around the circle and uh, 
and it wouldn't work. So uh, it's, it's good that the proof works only when P is less than one half because otherwise the theorem is false. Okay, so um, we have for each pair independently uh, at random, we choose the pair Xi, Yi with this distribution. And then I can calculate what's the probability, what's the expected value of Xi I of Xi times Xi I of Yi. So I, I won't do the calculation. You'll have to trust me that it's minus P over Q. Okay, now back to our family A and we look at its indicator function F. Let's look at F, F of X times F of Y. Now, X and Y can't both belong to the family because they're disjoint. So either X is in the family or Y is in the family, which means that either F of X is one or F of Y is one, but not both. Perhaps they're both zero. So F of X times F of Y is identically zero. And in particular, its expected value is zero. Now let's look at the Fourier expansion of that. So we write the Fourier expansion of X, the Fourier expansion of Y, we take the expectation. Expectation is linear, it goes uh, uh, inside and all the cross terms uh, vanish because uh, whenever I is different from J, there's some coordinate uh, which is only calculated, let's say in uh, chi J of Y or in chi I of X, and then its expectation is zero so we're, we're, we're only left with the non-cross terms. So we get the expectation of the Fourier coefficient squared times chi i of x chi i of y. And now, because every coordinate was chosen independently, I have here the expectation of a product. I can turn it into the product of expectations because the coordinates were chosen independently. So I get the sum of f squared i times the product of chi i x i chi i y i and if you recall that a uh, um th that uh, product that that expectation was minus p over q so i get this nice expression sum of uh, uh the squares of the Fourier coefficient for every set i i get a factor of minus p over q uh the number of times i get it is the size of i Okay, um, so I have, uh, I have the zero equals to this. Let's see, and um, let me, uh, let me paste this here, okay. So I, I'm just uh, reminding you that uh, the Fourier coefficient of the empty set is mu and the sum of all the squares of the Fourier coefficients are mu. So I take this, uh, um, this sum, this should be here the, the size of i. And first of all, I, I put aside the Fourier coefficient of the empty set, which is mu, so that gives me mu squared. And then I have the sum for all non-empty i. And now look at this expression, minus P over Q to the I. P is less than one half, so minus P over Q, minus P over Q is uh, between zero and minus one. It's strictly greater than minus one. Its absolute value is strictly smaller than one. So if I have here an even power, then it's positive. And if I have a, an odd power, then the larger the odd power is, the smaller it is by um, absolute value. So the smallest this expression can be is when the size of i is precisely minus one. So, and all these coefficients are, the squares are positive. So if I take minus p over q out of the sum, I'm only making the whole thing smaller. So I have mu squared plus minus p over q times the rest of the squares. Now recall the sum of all of the squares was mu, but I took one mu squared out, so I only have mu minus mu squared. So I get zero is greater or equal to mu squared minus p over q mu minus mu squared. I rearrange and I get what I want, that p is greater or equal to mu. So this is a, quite an interesting proof. 
one thing that you learn from this proof also, um, first of all, if you study where, uh, when can this inequality be tight, then the only way it can be tight if, is if uh, the Fourier coefficients were non-zero only when the sets were of size one, and it's an easy exercise to show that that implies that, in fact, the function depends only on one, co one coordinate. So you also get the equality uh, condition. You get the fact that if you have equality, if, if mu is exactly equal to p, then it's a function of one coordinate. And another thing you can do, but that, this already takes more uh, Fourier proficiency, is get a stability version. So you say if this is almost tight, then almost all the Fourier uh, coefficients sit on the first level. And then you can use certain theorems and show that that means that it's close to being a function depending on one coordinate. So you can get robustness versions of this theorem uh, using this technique. Okay, so uh, I'm sure many of you have asked yourself, what do I mean when I mentioned half a proof? So when I mentioned half a proof, I didn't mean a proof which is incorrect. I meant a proof which seems totally different, but actually it isn't. So I'm going to show you now a fourth proof, but and it, it won't look at all like the Fourier proof, but it is the Fourier proof. I'll explain it then why it is, and therefore I'm only counting it as proof number 3.5 and not as proof number four. So I'm going to use Hoffman's bound, which is a result in spectral graph theory. So let's read what Hoffman says. If G is a deregular graph on N vertices, and it has, so it, then its largest eigenvalue is D, and if it's connected, then uh, uh, it, that's also the largest eigenvalue. It, it, then the D has multiplicity one, and if, unless it's a bipartite, then all other eigenvalues are also um, is smaller than D with a, uh, an absolute value. So let's say the minimal eigenvalue is lambda. Lambda is going to be negative. And uh, let's say you have an independent set, then Hoffman gives a bound on the size of the independent set. Uh, uh, you take the whole number of vertices. So let's, let's write it like this. Let's, uh, uh, let's divide by the number of vertices. The proportion of, uh, proportion, uh, the proportional size of the independent set is at most minus lambda times d minus lambda. Oh, I see I already did that. Okay, so, um, so this works for a, a regular graph. Now let's go back to the two-point space and look at the graph uh, which uh, uh, we're interested in. So why am I interested in this graph? This graph tells me that one is an independent set and, and zero is not an, I'm sorry, yes. One is an independent set, but zero is not an independent set. Um, and so the largest independent set in, 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 in this graph has measure P. And I, I'd like to prove that. Uh, but this graph isn't a regular graph. Right? This has degree one and this has degree two. But, but if we put weights on the edges, then we can turn it into a one regular graph. So the edge going from one, to, I'm going to turn it into a directed graph. The, the edge going from one to zero will have weight one. And the two edges leaving zero, one of them you return to where you are with probability Q minus P over Q. And you go to one with probability P over Q. And what, what is the connection between the weights I put here on the edges and this, uh, the measure we have on the vertices? The answer is that you can do a random walk now according to these probabilities. When you're at one, you have to move to zero. When you're at zero, you either move to zero or to one according to these weights. Then mu p, the weight where you have q here and p here, is the stationary, stationary, stationary measure of this walk. And every two consecutive points in this walk have disjoint support. This should remind you of the x and the y. If I go from zero to zero, zero and zero have this joint support, and zero and one have this joint support, but one and one don't have this joint support. So I can't go from one to one, I have to go to zero. Uh, 
Now, this graph is one regular. And I can write the, uh, instead of the adjacency matrix, I'll write the transition matrix of this Markov uh, chain. And I get the minimal eigenvalues minus P over Q, which should be a, a quantity that you remember that we've already encountered. And we can plug this into uh, Hoffman's bound. And you have P over Q minus lambda divided by D, D minus lambda is P over Q divided by one plus P over Q is P. So Hoffman's bound tells us that in this graph, the measure of the maximal independent set is P. And now amazingly, everything tensorizes. When I say everything, I mean everything, first of all, in the sense, well, the graph I'm going to look at is, uh, um, I'm going to take this graph and uh, take its tensor with itself n times. So there's a graph product, uh, and uh, one way to define it is you take the adjacency matrix of G and the adjacency matrix of H, and the adjacency matrix of G times H is the tensor of those two matrices. So I can take this graph and tensor itself n times, and then I get a graph where an independent set on that graph is precisely an intersecting family. So this tensor, is exactly what we need to uh, encode our, our problem about intersecting families. And of course, the product, the, the measure on the tensor is going to be the product measure. And the nice thing is that if Hoffman's bound is tight for a graph, it's, it will stay tight for the products of that graph. It turns out the, the eigenvalues of, of this graph are the uh, products of the eigenvalues of the smaller graph. So you take uh, the set uh, one and minus p over q as a set, and you uh, tensor it n times. So all the two to the n possible eigenvalues you get are all possible ways of taking a uh, product of n numbers where each of them is either one or minus p over q. So the maximal eigenvalue is going to be one, and the smallest eigenvalue is going to be once again, minus p over q, and you can again plug it into Hoffman's bound and get the bound p. And I claim that that was the same proof as proof three. And the reason I'm saying it's the same proof is because in the previous proof, I, I um, oh, oh, sorry, in this proof, I used a, uh, I used Hoffman's uh, uh, lemma, Hoffman's theorem, as a black box. But if you write out the proof of Hoffman's theorem, then you'll be writing out what I, what I did here. This is exactly the proof of Hoffman's theorem. So uh, I claim that these two proofs are the same. And it's nice to look at. And one way to notice the, the, the same is that uh, when I go to this graph and I look at the product measure, it's, it's the stationary measure of some uh, random walk. And that random walk, two consecutive steps in that random walk are x and y, where x and y have uh, their, their uh, um, I'm talking asymptotically uh, as the walk goes to infinity, uh, each step has, uh, its, its marginal will be mu p but consecutive steps will be disjoint, and that will be precisely the x and y, which I, I chose uh, uh, in this proof. And uh, Hoffman's, uh, Hoffman's proof shows us that the Fourier proof essentially is one dimensional. It's just, you have to do something in one dimensions and then tensor it, and it gives you everything. Okay, proof number four is very different. Uh, it's back to um, elementary combinatorics. So we want to uh, calculate the independence ratio in a graph, meaning the ratio between the largest independent set and the number of vertices in the graph. So let's say I have a graph and I can cover it with triangles, disjoint triangles. I can cover all the vertices. Then obviously any independent set can contain at most one third of the vertices in that graph because its intersection with any triangle can contain at most one of the three vertices in the triangle. And in general, if I can 
partition the vertices of, of the graph into sets where each set has independence ratio at most alpha, meaning that the intersection of any independent set with that set has at most alpha proportion, then of course the whole graph has at most independence ratio alpha. And furthermore, I don't really have to partition the vertices. It's, it's enough, it suffices if I can cover the vertices with such sets such, such that every vertex belongs to the same number of sets. So if I have a family of triangles such that every vertex in my graph belongs to the same number of triangles, um, then once again, the, the independence ratio is going to be at most one third because I choose one of those triangles at random and it's expected intersection with the independent set. On one hand, it can be at most one third of those three vertices. And on the other hand, because it's uniform uh, on all vertices, it's at most the measure of the independent set. So oh, it, it's the measure of the independent set. So the measure of the independent set is at most one third. Um, now, we can take this one step further. If, instead of covering my graph by nice independent sets, I'm going to lift the graph up and cover the, co and cover the covering space nicely. So let's say, see, here's the graph I'm interested in. This is the graph which encodes uh, the independent sets in 0, 1 to the n. And I want to find, the, we call this graph G, I want to find an H which covers G. What does it, and such that H is easy to analyze. What do I mean that H covers G? I want to have a, a homomorphism from H to G, which is measure preserving. So let me remind you what a homomorphism is and what I mean by measure preserving. So usually when we say there's a homomorphism from H to G, we just mean that if two vertices have an edge between them and H, they have to have an edge between them and G. But a different way of saying it, which is more useful for us, is that if you have an independent set in G, then its inverse image is independent in H. That's the same thing, right? So a homomorphism, if you take the inverse of the homomorphism, it lifts independent sets in G to independent sets in H. And I want, to be, I want it to be measure preserving. That If I take any set in G, I look at its inverse image, it has the same measure. And then if I have a nice bound on the independence ratio in H will give me a bound on the independence ratio in G. So once again, let's start with the one dimensional case. So I'm going to tell you what H is in the one dimensional case. Consider a graph which has a continuum of vertices. So the graph is, uh, the vertices are the points of a circle with circumference one. Here are all the vertices of the graph. And I won't draw all the edges because there's a continuum squared of them. So there are edges between two vertices if the distance is at least p. So in other words, an independent set has to be contained in an interval of an, in, an open interval of length p. So this is what an uh, independent set looks like. It's, an, it's contained in an open interval of length p. So Clearly, the, the independence ratio in, in this graph, let's call this graph uh, H, or well, call it the H1 because it's the one dimensional case, uh, the, the independence ratio is at most P. So now it's easy to construct a homomorphism from this graph to this graph, choose any arbitrary interval P and send it to uh, the point one and take its complement and send it to zero. Well, of course, this is measure preserving because the inverse image of this has measure P and the inverse image of this has measure one minus P. And it's a homomorphism because the inverse image of an independent set, this is the only independent set. Its inverse image is also an independent set. So this is a homomorphism. And the nice thing is that this tensorizes. I take this graph, I tensor it with itself n times, and I, and, I automatically get the, the nth tensor of this homomorphism, which gives me a, a homomorphism from this graph to this graph. Now, the reason I did this is I claim that this graph is easy to partition into, into uh, sets which have independence ratio P. So first of all, what is this graph? This, this graph is a torus. The vertices are an n-dimensional torus. And 
when is there an edge for something to have an edge? Uh, it, two vertices have an edge if in every coordinate their, dis their distance is at least p. So I'll show you how to partition this graph very nicely into independent sets. Let, let me draw, uh, I wrote here something, but before, don't bother reading what I wrote, I'll, I'll draw it for you. Um, so let's, uh, uh, here, here um, I'm going to draw the two dimensional case. So uh, here's, um, Uh, one, two, three, four, five by one, two, three. Four. Okay, um, here's this torus, and uh, yeah, is it six by six? And uh, I'll partition it into um, uh, circles who, uh, who go in this direction. So this is one circle, and this is another circle. So clearly, I can partition the whole torus into sets of this form. You fix some x, and you go in the direction 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and you wrap all the way around the torus. And now let's look at the graph induced on this circle. If you think about it for a minute, you'll see that the graph induced on this circle is precisely the one-dimensional graph. It's precisely a circle, once you normalize it, uh, where there's an edge between uh, uh, any two vertices if uh, their distance is uh, uh, more than p times the circumference. So I managed to partition the whole torus into, uh, actually partition it into parts which have uh, independence ratio p, and then I, uh, I, I cover this graph and I discovered that this graph also has independence ratio at most p. Okay, so that's, that's, it's, uh, the proof is slightly surprising because if you try to partition this graph immediately without lifting it, uh, you'll find that it's hard. You, you can't, if you try to hide where you got the partitioning from, it, it will look very strange. It's very hard to partition this, this graph directly. Okay, the last proof, I'm running out of time, so I'll rush through the last proof. Uh, the last proof, I, I said, take a log, discover a surprise. So I'll rush through it and we'll get straight to the surprise. Um, but of course, the, uh, this is recorded, so you can go back and look at the notes again. So I'm just reminding you, we're assuming that our family is monotone. And remember that uh, the family can contain its set and its complement, so the size of the family is at most two to the n minus one, meaning that the measure at p equals one half is at most one half. And um, I want to prove that, that, that my family has, the, uh, okay, this is a fact uh, uh, that we know from the other proofs that if the measure of my family is precisely p, no matter what p is, that happens if and only if uh, my family is a, a subcube of co-dimension one. And so this, this tells you maybe, maybe we should look at the co-dimension, maybe it's telling us something. So if we go back to the uniform measure um, and take any monotone A and look at the number of edges leaving A, going from A to its complement, there's an isoparametric inequality that says the size of that is at most the size of A times log base two of this ratio. So this ratio is the co-dimension of A if A were a cube. So if A is a co-dimension, is a cube of co-dimension one, this will be two. If A is a co-dimension, uh, uh, a cube of co-dimension two, this will be four, etc. So it's telling you that the influence of A, I don't have time to tell you what I mean by that, the number of edges leaving A is at most the measure of A, times the co-dimension of A. So this says maybe we should define co-dimension for every P, and this is how I define it. I say if A were a cube, its measure would be P to the power of something, so let's call that something alpha, alpha A of P, and here's its definition. The co-dimension of A is log base P of the measure of A. Uh, 
And, and we said that the co-dimension at one half is at least one, meaning that the measure of my family is at most one half. And what we want, we want our, the measure of a family always to be less than P. So we want the co-dimension always to be at least one. So it would be sufficient if we show that this function decreases when we go from zero to one half. At one half, the co-dimension is one, or the pseudo co-dimension, this function is one. And what we want to prove is that it's greater or equal to one on all the intervals. So we want to show it's decreasing. So you take a derivative, you get this strange ex expression, you try to write out when, when does this, when is this smaller than zero? And you get, a, you get this expression. This is smaller than zero if mu prime times p is less than mu times log of mu. And it turns out that this is precisely the generalization of this. Let me. So um, we, sorry, what did I just do? Okay. Uh, so uh, this was the, um, I, I somehow I pasted this in a, in a bad place. One second, sorry. Okay, so uh, what I'm trying to say is that um, uh, this inequality is the generalization of the hypercontracted, uh, of the isoparametric inequality that we have for the uniform measure. And it was proven by, uh, independently, it was proven many years ago by Grimmett and it was rediscovered by Kanan Kalai. And it's true, which means that the function we wanted to be decreasing is decreasing. And uh, so to summarize, we took a set that was monotone because the isoparametric inequality is true for these monotone decreasing uh, families. And it had size at most two to the n minus one. And we managed to prove that its measure is at most p. Now, what is the surprise? The surprise is, uh, as noted in a paper by Ellis Keller and Lifshitz, it holds for any monotone A which has size at most two to the n minus one. So we didn't use the fact that it's intersecting. This whole talk was a talk about intersecting families, but in fact, you don't need the fact that it's intersecting. It suffices that it's monotone and that it has size at most uh, two to the n minus one. So that came to me as a surprise and um, I think this is a good place to end the talk. Uh, Jan, are you trying to talk because you're muted? Uh -huh. Okay, so thank you a lot, Ehud, for the for the talk.